My name is Paul Walsh. I'm the Brenna Research Director in the Emergency Medicine Program at Kern Medical Center and UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, we have an affiliation uh, that uh, we use. Um, my interest in RSP goes back to about 2000, 2001, where I, um, I started uh, doing research in bronchiolitis in National Children's Hospital in Dublin. And I've been doing research in either RSP or bronchiolitis pretty much ever since. Uh, the, there's a, a lot of work going on here at KMC, so that if your child is brought in with respiratory difficulty, there's a good chance that you'll be offered uh, enrollment in a study. And if you, your child gets into a study, that, that has certain advantages for the parents. And one of them is that we do extensive testing of the viruses. And this doesn't involve any painful blood test, this just involves taking the phlegm from the child's nose, uh, which we would normally do anyway, uh, but uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, medical diagnostic labs in New Jersey, uh, who very helpfully have provided a lot of the funding for this, what we have done is uh, te develop PCR assays for pertussis, paraprotussis, influenza A, influenza B, RSVA, RSVB, and human metanumavirus. So the first thing we get is we say, well, what virus or viruses does this child have? When the child is seen in the emergency room and we're collecting these, we uh, obtain informed consent to collect a lot of clinical information. So we collect about 180 uh, data points on every child we get. And if we discharge the child, we follow them up at home. So we will have uh, some one of our research assistants call the family at home, see how the child is doing. The Research goes a step further when we look at uh, the G protein of the RSV virus and try and correlate it with outcomes. So RSV is an interesting virus. On the one hand, it can cause nothing more than a runny nose. Somewhere in the middle, you have a baby who's wheezing and sounds terrible, but is actually perfectly happy. And at the other extreme, you have infants who, for some reason, just stop breathing. And if you look at sudden unexpected infant deaths, you can implicate RSV in a substantial proportion of those. Is there any particular type of RSV which is well, that's more virulent than another type? There are subtypes A, B, and S. We know that subtype S is uh, less virulent than others, and I won't say virulent, but it, it causes less severe disease than, than the other two. It's controversial whether there's a difference in A or B, and we've kind of gone beyond that, and we're looking at the G protein itself. And we're doing that based on previous work in the literature that, that suggests there may be something there that it contributes to the outcome. So one of the studies that parents will be approached with if they come to KMC uh, and their child is eligible uh, is the method of uh, sample collection. The traditional way of doing this was described in 1975 by Hall, which involves taking uh, saline, uh, squirting it into the nose of the bulb syringe, pulling back the secretions and in that you have your sample. And that has pretty much become the standard uh, way of doing things uh, ever since. And uh, it's a practical kind of thing. You look at the, you, at the saline, you get back and see do you have what you need in it. And uh, nurses, every nurse develops their own trick and they get pretty good at it. Uh, so that's the step in the standard way. However, in the first year of our work, what we realized was that we were running into problems with dilution. Um, so that begged the question, well, could we do it another way? Typically, you're dealing with a couple of mills, um, and most of that is saline. Uh, during our processing, we aliquot it down to very small subsamples, and so there's always a risk that even when you agitate the sample, you'll end up with you know, le less of the sample than you would like. Take a bulb, um, and uh, it brings some saline into it put a couple of drops of saline in the child's nose, squirt the saline into the child's nose and pull it back. Um, and the kids don't like it, but you know, it's, they have, we have to clear the secretions anyway because at this age they're obligate nasal breathers. So if their nose is blocked, they can't breathe through their mouth, they have to breathe through their nose. So the next question was, well, could we replace this with a swab? And a swab will be attractive in that it will be easier for transport um, because we have a lot of handling of, of saline samples and traditional cotton swabs don't work well for this. So we looked around and we know that the uh, flocked swab has been used uh, for GC and chlamydia, uh, PCR uh, 
in the past and, and it seems to work. So it, it seemed a logical choice. Uh, the standard method of getting a swab is to use a nasopharyngeal swab. That's pretty invasive. Um, it involves you sort of measure from nose to ear, and that's pretty much how far you're putting the swab in. And uh, we were concerned that a lot of people wouldn't be uh, uh, willing to. Think. Well, it's not particularly traumatic, but it's something that people probably would not be willing to subject their child to. And you know, why would you, frankly, if you didn't have to? For some conditions, you do have to, um, but for this, you really don't. So we then wanted to develop a swab that we could just do just in the anterior nares. And what we started with was using urethral swabs and put, giving people a little ruler and say, this is how far we want you to put it in. Um, and, you know, our staff are all very busy and it, it's, people look at it and they sort of look a little bit askance. So, so we said, well, maybe we can do a little better. So what we developed was uh, this swab, which we call the Bakersfield swab. So we went to the plastic surgery literature and were able to obtain from that where they've got normative ranges for uh, size of the nose, size of the various parts of your nose. And we're able to realize that under two years of age, you pretty much could use a, 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 a one size fits all. Clearly it'll be a little bit bigger for, too big for some and a little bit too small for others. But on average, uh, using these dimensions, we were able to develop a swab that would work uh, for pretty much anyone under two years of age. Um, we wanted to, it to be uh, essentially an anterior nasal swab. We didn't really want to go beyond the, the middle terminus. We did want to hit the middle terminus, but we didn't want to go beyond it. Um, and we didn't want people to either put it in further than that, or worse again, not put it in far enough. Because the tendency for people is to just barely touch the side of the front of the nose. And that's good for swabbing for staph aureus, but it's not much use for swabbing for viruses. So we can then tell them with that we've got a little plastic mark on it here, a little guard, and we can tell people that you go in no further and not any less far than this. So this is the f how far in you go. And that makes it easy. When we were setting up the experiment, the traditional swabs uh, access the nasopharyngeal area here. Um, that's standard procedure when you're obtaining samples for pertussis, uh, particularly for pertussis culture. Uh, because we're trying to compare it with nasal washings, we had to make sure we didn't really get beyond here. And this was our target po uh, point here. For RSV, you're typically targeting here. Okay. Uh, RSV, influenza, uh, metanumavirus, this area here seems perfectly adequate to get your specimen from. Uh, that's what we've used with nasal washings for years. Uh, but yeah, I think, they, I think they've, they've gotten the idea of it, and it sort of intuitively it makes sense. Um, so something making sense intuitively and something actually working is a different kettle of fish. So the next phase was to then compare this with nasal washings. Now, of course, there's an immediate advantage because this gets transported in media, which contains a preservative. And so in order to balance the playing field, we randomized children to either have a swab done from a nostril first or have a nasal washing done first. And then the other thing that was randomized was uh, which nostril it was. So by random chance alone, the child would receive it from either the washing first or the, nostril or the, or the swab first. And uh, we then split the washing and processed one in the standard fashion and the other half we put into the same transport medium. Right. So now we're comparing like with like. So you put the swab in the transport tube no, with the and the washing in the transport tube? Yes, in a separate transport tube got it. with the same preservative. Got it. So now you've got a fair comparison. Uh, and what we found was, uh, and the initial study was just on a small data set, so initially we're really only powered to look at agreement. And we found a substantial to almost perfect agreement between the two techniques. However, what we did do notice is that there's this swab seemed to have a higher pickup rate. It's too early to make much of that because until we have more cases, we really don't we don't want to go saying, oh, this is better than, than the washing. We just we're not entitled to say that at this point. But the initial data does suggest that we may pick up more cases with this, and that was pretty consistent uh, across all the viruses we tested for.